Dear parliamentarians from all over Europe, well, I really wanted to be with you in Berlin today, but due to the pandemic, this is not possible. It's a pity. And uh, I think it's particularly sad because I know that I'm in extremely good company with you today, but at least online virtually. So you all know, indeed, our meeting couldn't come at a more crucial time for Europe. That's what Gunther Griechbaum just said. The corona crisis is far from over. Europe is severely hit by the second wave of the virus. And we all know parts of Europe are in lockdown basically to save lives. And despite all the consequences this has for workers and companies. In other words, the uncertainty continues, but differently than in March in the first wave. Today, we know that there is a way out. And the good news is that we have the tools to combat this crisis. Just remember, when member states closed borders, we created green lanes for goods. We worked with European industry, for example, to boost or increase the production of essential medical goods like masks, gloves, tests and ventilators. And most important, just recently, the Commission has secured around 2 billion doses of a potential vaccine against the virus. So what we did is we closed contracts with six pharmaceutical companies. They are working on the most promising vaccine candidates. And so far, things go well. They are all producing here in Europe. At the moment being, the member states are working on the vaccination plans and on the logistics for the deployment of tens of millions of doses of vaccine. Because just to say it, it's not the vaccine that is important, the vaccinations are important. So if everything goes well, the first European citizens might already be vaccinated before the end of December. And this will be a huge step forward towards our normal life. In other words, I just want to say there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we still have to be disciplined till we have reached finally a vaccination that is appropriate to eradicate this virus. And then, of course, uh, Gunther Kriechbaum did mention it. There is the recovery plan. Next Generation EU, we call it, and the new European budget. The European Council decided on it in summer. And yes, as Gunther Kriechbaum said, the, 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 the package is currently blocked by two member states. So as a commission, we fully support the presidency in finding a solution for remaining differences. But I will come back later to this point. To find a way out of the crisis, and that's the principle of next generation EU. Europe needs substantial investment. So our recovery package next generation EU is worth 750 billion euros. And important is that with this money, we don't only want to combat the economic consequences of the crisis. This is one purpose. But what we need to do is we need to build forward better. We have to modernize. We take this investment really to improve. And we want to create a more sustainable, a more digital and a more resilient Europe. This is a once in a generation opportunity. So getting next generation up and running, this is just up to us. And therefore, please allow me to look back for a moment this summer, you remember, the Union was at a crossroad. And we saw the risk that many of our member states could not cope with the huge impact of the crisis or just would recover at a way, way slower pace than others. And this would have been a fragmentation of the single market. At that point, Europe did the right thing because together we managed to put forward a plan that would benefit Europe as a whole, so north or south or east or west. And what we did, we said we want investment and reforms, both of it. So we developed a plan that will not only repair our economy, but also prepare for the future. And with Next Generation EU, we have shown how strong the power of solidarity can be. 
So we have paved the way for the idea to invest jointly as 27 to fight this crisis. And I think this was a remarkable moment of unity for the Union. And this is an achievement that we should take collective pride in. But, as I've already said, two member states have raised doubts. In July, all 27 heads of state and government agreed on a new conditionality mechanism. In fact, it addresses breaches of the principle of the rule of law that threaten the European budget, and only these. So we think that the conditionality mechanism is appropriate, it is proportionate and it is necessary. And it is hard to imagine that anyone could object. But if someone does have legal doubts, there is a very clear path. They can go to the European Court of Justice. This is the place where we usually trash our differences of opinion regarding legal tests and not at the expense of millions of Europeans who are desperately waiting for our help because we are amidst a deep, deep crisis. And here, time is of the essence. Time is really of the essence. We want, with Next Generation EU, to press fast forward towards a stronger Europe. And to achieve this, we need you. And let me talk a little bit about that. We need you, the parliamentarians, to put policy into practice because these recovery plans are national recovery plans and they have to be created regionally and at the local level and at the national level. And you will be the ones bringing the projects to life on the ground. So we need your ideas for the recovery plans that uh, each member state is now putting together. We have principles, European principles. It has to invest in the European Green Deal, in the digitalization and in the resilience of our economy. But for that, we need ideas. So we want, for example, if I speak about the Green Deal, to kickstart a European renovation wave. You all know that we want to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And if you look at buildings, Buildings account for 40% of our emissions. And very often, they waste most of the energy that they consume. Now we've looked at the current modernization path um, of buildings and at the current pace of this modernization, it would take more than a century to bring the emissions from buildings down to zero. So if we want to reach our climate goals, one of the project's pillars is we must double the pace of renovations by 2025. And therefore, we invest in that. So the building sector generates enormous economic value, as you know, at the regional and local level. So please tell your colleagues back home about this great opportunity to turn European investment into local growth. That's the principle. And this is just uh, another example how our European Green Deal can work as Europe's new growth strategy. This is the principle that we are pushing forward to develop modern, clean technologies in the European Green Deal. And it is good to see that indeed Europe is getting company. I remember very well a year ago when we said we want to be the first climate neutral um, continent in 2050, we were all alone. But now more and more economic powerhouses around the globe share our ambition. Look at Japan or South Korea or South Africa. They have committed to climate neutrality by 2050. China has now decided to become carbon neutral by 2060. And we look forward, of course, to the United States rejoining the Paris Agreement, as President-elect Joe Biden has already announced. This is big news and good news. So I'm sure that the fight against climate change can be a key area where Europe takes the initiative and offers a positive new agenda with our trusted partners, the United States. This will also be an important moment for our multilateral rules-based system. 
we want to work with our partners to strengthen international organizations, be it the United Nations or the WTO or now the WHO. Global challenges require strong multilateral institutions and they have to be backed by strong commitments from member countries. And we have seen the full power and the full potential of cooperation during the pandemic. We know that faced with the crisis, some have chosen to isolate. Others have tried to use this very difficult situation to strike geopolitical gains. Europe has chosen to cooperate and to cooperate in the interest of the common good and to lend a helping hand to partners and friends in need. So what have we done? We have invested over 3 billion euros in the Western Balkans, for example, to buy ventilators or testing kits or protective equipment. We've sent tons of medical equipment to African countries. We were with the frontline doctors helping to fight COVID in Syrian refugee camps. And from the outset, and that's the most important, we organized a global response to the coronavirus, not a national one, not a European one, a global response. And by this, we have convened not only almost 190 countries worldwide, but also NGOs, business leaders, civil society. So with this group together, we are securing now millions of doses of future vaccines for low income countries. The principle is the high income countries invest. We call it COVAX facility so that low and middle income countries have access to equitable and affordable vaccines. And this is something no country could achieve just by itself. And this shows again the beauty of global cooperation. Et mesdames et messieurs les parlementaires, c'est un moment important pour nous. Vous les parlementaires européens, vous avez prouvé votre résilience au cours des derniers mois de la crise. Les parlements ont continué le débat conformément avec les règles. Ce n'était pas facile. Et là où les réunions physiques n'étaient pas possibles, les parlements ont tout fait pour maintenir en vie les débats et les échanges en, li les, les échanges en ligne, comme nous le faisons aujourd'hui. Et ainsi, les parlements ont veillé à ce que la crise épidémiologique ne se transforme pas dans une crise de la démocratie. Et je tiens à vous en remercier chaleureusement pour ça. Parlamente, wie Sie es gesagt haben, Gunter Kriechbaum, spielen in Europas Demokratien eine ganz entscheidende Rolle. Und daher werden die Parlamente auch bei der Konferenz zur Zukunft Europas die entscheidende Rolle spielen. Die Konferenz in der Tat ist und bleibt ein wichtiges Vorhaben, gerade jetzt in der Pandemie. Sie liegt mir persönlich sehr am Herzen. Und wenn es angesichts der Pandemie nur irgend geht, dann wollen wir noch vor Ende des Jahres damit starten. Das heißt, die Kommission gemeinsam mit dem Rat und mit dem Europäischen Parlament. Und die Struktur, die wir bauen, hat eine ganz klare Rolle für die nationalen Parlamente. Im Augenblick sieht es so aus, dass wir eine mehrsprachige Online-Plattform aufbauen werden, die uns dabei helfen wird und die wird eine wichtige Rolle spielen in diesen Zeiten, so wie wir das heute auch machen. Wir möchten, dass die Bürgerinnen und Bürger stärker mitreden, wenn es um die Zukunft Europas geht. Wir wollen wissen, was sie umtreibt, wenn sie an Europa denken. Und in der Tat, dabei können wir auf niemanden verzichten, in keiner Stadt, in keinem Dorf, keiner Region oder keinem Bundesland. Deswegen sind wir auf Ihre Mithilfe angewiesen. Sie, die Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier, Sie kennen Ihre Heimat ja am besten. Sie können die Veranstaltung organisieren. Sie können die Menschen aus allen Teilen unserer Gesellschaft erreichen und zusammenbringen. Das heißt, nur wenn Sie, die Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier, mit Leidenschaft und Tatkraft dabei sind, und ich weiß, dass ich mich darauf verlassen kann, wird die Konferenz die hohen Erwartungen erfüllen, die wir alle jetzt in sie setzen. 
Den Weg bis hierher haben Sie bereits mit viel Engagement geprägt. Und wenn der Startschuss für die Konferenz fällt, dann weiß ich, dass ich mich auf Sie verlassen kann. Ich freue mich jetzt sehr auf den Austausch mit Ihnen und danke, dass Sie mir zugehört haben.